Thanks. I'd just like to acknowledge the CUA, the European Association of Urology, and AstraZeneca for their support of this exchange. So what happened last year was the CUA and the EAU got together, and uh, much like the AUA-EAU exchange, this is actually the first exchange of the CUA-EAU, and what's going to happen is it's every other year that a Canadian will go to Europe, and then on the alternating years, uh, the Europeans will come to Canada. So they put out a call last fall and uh, asked for basically four people. They asked for three junior participants, basically any active member of the AUA, and they wanted someone with a track record in research and or education. And you had to be under the age of 42, um, excellent track record, active membership in the CUA, and you basically had to travel for about, it was actually ended up being three weeks in, in March, ending at the EAU. And there was one senior member and three junior members. So we put in our applications by December 31st. The uh, CUA then made a decision. They had about 20 to 25 applicants, I think, and uh, made a decision. So uh, we ended up going, first of all, to uh, Malmo, Sweden, to see Per Anders Abramson, who was actually the Secretary General of the EAU. And unlike the AUA, who has a president every year, they actually don't have a president. They just basically have a Secretary General. Then we went to Sheffield, England, to see uh, Chris Chappell, who's big on urethras and then to Barcelona, Spain, where they do a lot of uh, notes and laparoscopy, and then to Milan, Italy, to visit Francesco Montorsi, and then finally ending in Vienna, which uh, was the site of the uh, 26th Annual European Association of Urology. So those are the sites that we visited, um, and um, we had a great time. Basically, the, so the people we went with were Jerzy Gajewski from uh, Halifax, from Dalhousie. He does a lot of functional voiding, so a lot of urodynamics, um, a lot of neurostim, and of course, we all gave talks at these centers, so we got to know each other's research uh, pretty well. Uh, that's me, of course. Anthony Bella from University of Ottawa, who did a fellowship with Tom Liu at University of San Francisco. And uh, he uh, does a lot of things in andrology, men's health, um, pretty much just does implants now for, uh, and, and pyronis disease. Those are pretty much the two operations that he's focused on. His waiting list is already 18 months. And he's got quite a good uh, research program that started up. He does have an uh, endowed chair at Ottawa. Armando Lorenzo, who when you hear him speak actually doesn't sound Canadian at all. He actually sounds, uh, he has a Spanish accent. It's because he's actually not a Canadian citizen yet. He's actually from Panama. So he's Panamanian and he did a fellowship at uh, Sick Kids in Toronto and is a pediatric urologist there now on staff. And he did his uh, residency at UT Southwestern Texas. So we visited with uh, various people. We went to their certain rounds and uh, just kind of got a gist of how the, the European urology runs. This is pathology rounds and oncology, um, endourology rounds. So we got to visit in on these people. We went to the operating room with them, uh, spent some time there, uh, observed a lot of robot surgery. Um, Armando even scrubbed in. Uh, we were technically not supposed to, but anyways, uh, uh, Armando did. We sat in a lot of research center uh, discussions and presentations. M most of the places had their research centers present almost an entire day to us. We stayed in some nice hotels. Some places were just okay. Um, we ended up at the EAU, which was a, a, a really interesting meeting. I've never been to the EAU before, uh, and which, of course, is the biggest meeting in Europe. And it's getting even bigger now, too. And they're trying to attract a lot more of the Asians, um, and a, a particularly a lot more of the Arab countries as well, because it's a lot easier for them to get to Europe, and they don't have such uh, big visa issues like they do for going to the States for the AUA. So it's becoming an increasingly important meeting. So what we first started was we, we flew into Malmo, Sweden. And it's, as you can see, it's in the southern part of Sweden. Vancouver's at 49th parallel. This is at the 56th parallel. But the weather was very similar because it's right on the water. There's no real big airport there. So in fact, we flew into Denmark. We actually flew into Copenhagen. And then they have a 60-kilometer bridge uh, that you actually go over. And then we, we, we actually drove over to Malmo. So this is the, this is the bridge that uh, spans. And in fact, it was so, it's so long, they actually had to make a, a man-made island in the middle for some support as well but uh, quite a feat of engineering. It's only been built since 1990. A lot of uh, windmills, as you can see, wind power. And there uh, we met with uh, Per Anders Abramson, and this is his wife, and this is Magnus Grabe, who's also done a lot of publications on uh, antibiotic use in urology and was actually responsible for part of the uh, antibiotic um, guidelines for the EAU. <clears throat> so Per Anders Abramson, professor, is the secretary general of the EAU, 
and he's been chairman of the Lund University uh, since 2000, that's uh, London, Sweden. And he actually did a fellowship in University of Rochester since 1993. And he was telling us stories that he was actually in Christchurch, New Zealand the week before we had met him. And he was uh, in his hotel when the earthquake actually happened. And uh, he managed to get out with basically just his, uh, with his wallet and that was it. And his wife was actually in the bathtub at the time. So she got in on a house coat and basically grabbed her iPhone. That's all they had. And she, they told us about the refugee camp they stayed at for the next little while and how it actually took them a while to get out of New Zealand. They finally managed to get to Singapore with basically nothing but the shirts on their backs. So Malmö, Sweden is a town of about 300,000, um, 56 degrees north. And like I said, Sweden's not, it's about a third the size of Canada, it's about 9 million. They love hockey. They were like, oh, you're from Vancouver. The twins, you know, they kept talking about the Sedins. They knew all of the uh, Swedish hockey players. And Lund University is the second largest in Sweden. Um, there's 44 faculty, actually. So before there was University of Malmö, University of Lund, and they actually combined, which is why it's such a big faculty now. Uh, it's a very interesting way of how they practice urology there. They cover four hospitals and they rotate around so they don't just make it fair to make that one guy go uh, 80 kilometers uh, you know, all the time. They basically take turns rotating around. So the chairman does have four year rotations but the urologists interestingly rotate through surgery and then clinic. It's a complete shared pool. They do have some sort of subspecialties, but it's sort of very different from here, where they will just have someone who's in clinic, and the person who does your cystoscopy and then books you for a TURBT is almost definitely not going to be the same person who actually does the TURBT. Um, you know, for RPLNDs and cystectomies and the uh, uh, robotic prostatectomies, those are tend to be done by more specialists. They did have one stone person who was more interested in that. But in general, people did rotate around and, and, and basically did uh, uh, almost everything. Urologists are on salary. Uh, they're paid by the hospital. And so basically the chief negotiates a, a lump sum of money for his department. And they're expecting, they're expecting to see a certain number of patients a year. And then everyone gets a salary, and it does vary a little bit, but the salary is somewhere between four to 5,000 euros a month. The workday is around 7.30 to four o'clock. There is private practice in Sweden as well. So, you know, they pay about 60, the hard, their highest tax bracket is close to 60%, and uh, they do have private practice as well. The chief is not allowed to see private practice patients, some of the other university professors are, are, are but mo most of them um, do, and but the higher people do not, are not allowed to, and I, I suspect they get paid quite a bit more. So uh, research at MAMA, well, we had one full day of research presentations where they had uh, um, their one main guy, Bartel, who must have had about, I think they have about 30 people working in the lab there. We had discussions about uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and using the Eurovision. Um, cystoscopy uh, system, looking at free PSA imaging in vivo in mice, looking at monoclonal antibodies and PET scanning. Uh, they were trying to discover new stem cells in kidneys to regenerate tubular cells after ATM, which I thought was really interesting. So they have a big pathology component there as well. They also looked at an association because they have such good databasing in Sweden. They were looking at infertility and actually found that infertility uh, is actually protective against prostate cancer. So not being able to have children actually did reduce the risk of prostate cancer in their series. Uh, Galeolactone, which actually comes from a fungus, are looking at nutraceuticals and their effect on LINCAP cells and did find a positive effect. And they're looking at other, um, other, other herbs and things like that as, that as well. And like other places, they actually found that obesity and prostate cancer in Sweden does not have an associated risk. Of course, Sweden is much lower on the list uh, compared to North America uh, on, on obesity. And of course, they have open lab concept as well. So all faculty, no matter whether you're just clinical associate or, or uh, you know, driving 80 miles away to, to do something else, they're all uh, um, required to do research and participate in that. So basically every morning, this is a little different, it's quite different from our system, every morning at 8 o'clock they meet and the chief sits there and listens to what all the inpatients are. So it's quite different. Um, it, it basically everyone reports on who was admitted last night, how the post-op patients are doing, and if there's any uh, other cases on the ward. And I mean any other cases. Mr. So-and-so was admitted for hematuria last night and uh, uh, basically going over plans. So everyone is in the loop basically. 
This is the hospital at, uh, at, at Mamo. And uh, the winters weren't that bad, but still, they have about 30 kilometers of tunnels that run underneath the hospital. And in fact, they actually also have bicycles that you can just sort of use and go between the tunnels as well. Hospitals were very nice. They had uh, uh, reasonable, uh, quite a bit of money there. I mean, their economy is doing actually quite well. So this is the new radiology department they just put in and um, state-of-the-art equipment as well. Now, the one thing I'm going to document through my trip for every city is, you know, how to become a urologist in Sweden or in, in, in each place. And the reason why is because it's a little different everywhere, and I find it really fascinating how they train people and how you actually become a urologist. So you finish high school, you do medical school, it's five and a half years, not six years or five years, it's five and a half years. And it's a, it's a problem-based learning um, technique for two and a half years. Then you do three years of clinical work on the ward. How much does it cost? It's free, like all university in Sweden. So they have very well-educated people. It's all free, and even for foreigners, up to about 25% of the people that go, uh, in university at Sweden are actually foreigners. So there's a big uh, population from uh, Taiwan, China, and India. Next year, however, they're going to start charging, so that might decrease it a little bit, but still, uh, it, it's, 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 it's free for, for nationals. So you finish medical school, Everyone does two years of internship, rotating internship. Then you choose a residency. You're completely undifferentiated until then. Family medicine is five years after that. So if you're going to do family medicine, it's seven years. General surgery is four years. Then you can apply for urology, which is at least three years minimum. So total after finishing medical school to do urology is around nine years. And that three years minimum, most people do it in four, four years, maybe five years. So it could be anywhere from three to five. So then you become a junior attending. And I think this is the reason why uh, it, it, this is very different. You become independent when you actually become a professor. Even as a junior attending, you're still, you're still basically almost like, a, like, in our standpoint here, a very senior house staff, uh, senior resident. They do have the European work hours, uh, there, which mandates that residents cannot work more than 56 hours a week, including the time that you are on call. And uh, basically, their residents all said that this wasn't enough time for them, and they've ex basically been exempted from this. So they basically work more than their 56 hours allotted a week. So if you think about 56 hours and you're on call one night, that's 24 right there. So that's almost you know, a little bit less than half. So they've asked to repeal that. They, they do actually take in-house call, which is slightly different from our residents, because they, they cover a population of 1.5 million people, which would not be too dissimilar to us, but really they're only the one big hospital there. So um, they do do in-house, and call can be relatively busy. And the textbooks are all in English, so everyone spoke perfect English. And in fact, when we were doing the rounds with them, uh, just for our benefit, they actually did everything in English for us. So in this OR, they actually had four urology ORs that ran per day, and they also had lithotripsy as well, which was in the operating room. They have two da Vinci robots. They do two robotic radical prostatectomies a day. And at their center, 98% of the radical prostatectomies are done robotically, and uh, six surgeons are, are trained uh, to do them robotically. Uh, for SWAL, like, uh, like many other places in Europe, there's actually no anesthesiologist like we have here. They just do it with a nurse to monitor the patient and then a urologist and to give their own sedation, basically. And uh, Dennis Hosking in, in, in uh, Winnipeg in Canada does, does that as well. He just basically gives his own, his own uh, sedation and does the lithotripsy there. So they do uh, five per day and do about uh, three days a week. So they do about 600 a year. So they're, they're, they're fairly busy as well. We do about 2,500 here a year, just for comparison's sake. And they, we actually have the exact same machine. So the machine that we have has actually been the most popular one that I've seen in Europe as well. So I think uh, currently this is the best machine out there. So southern Sweden is quite different from northern Sweden. There's always that north-south divide. And in fact, it used to be part of Denmark only until recently, until 1658. And uh, there was a big you know, obviously a war between Denmark and Sweden, and Sweden obviously won, and there's still a bit of tension there today. But the interesting thing is, um, obviously they're both part of the European Union, so there's no border. When you cross the border on that bridge to go to, 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 go to Copenhagen, there's no uh, customs guy, there's no immigration. And in fact, many people that actually work in Copenhagen, because that's a much bigger city, actually live in Malmo, Sweden, because you actually, um, uh, it's actually cheaper to live there. So, uh, like I said, the bridge is 60 kilometers long. Just to, for comparison's sake, the, the bridge to PEI is 30 kilometers long. So what were the surprises about Sweden? Not everyone's blonde. I thought I'd just walk around and see these blonde people. I heard, I maybe saw like four blonde people. It was really just everyone, maybe it was the south, I don't know. 
But everyone speaks flawless English. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. I was like, wow, are you from the States? Like, it was really, uh, really, really flawless English. And even though we were, you know, sort of just coming out of the winter, the food and the fruit was really good. And I'm just talking about everyday fruit that just came from the hotel, from stands. Everything was really good. And some of the top chefs in Europe are now actually from Sweden. So the, the, they're, they're, they're really sort of um, uh, improving their, their, their status. And, and Swedish food was actually very good. I mean, before this, my only knowledge of Swedish food was from Ikea. So it was uh, quite different. Um, a lot of the guys love Rush. I don't know why. There's a big cult following of the Canadian band Rush. So, uh, and, and we didn't have to pay in euros. It was a Swedish Kron, and it's not tied to the euro. So I think they're, they're, they're very uh, happy about that right now. And in fact, their economy right now is currently the fastest growing in Europe and even faster than Germany's. So the last surprise about Sweden was that in their clinics, office furniture, IKEA. There was a ton of IKEA stuff everywhere, obviously. And they obviously had a huge Ikea's there. So I was kind of interested to see whether or not they would sort of uh, um, be, you know, amenable to Ikea. But there was a lot of Ikea stuff around. So most places we did spend going to the OR, giving talks and, and talking to the research people. And, and depending if it was a weekend or not, we'd either get a half day or a day to sort of do some, some sightseeing. So that we did get a guide for one day. And uh, we went over to Copenhagen, which interestingly enough is the second most uh, bike city friendly in the world bike-friendly city in the world next to Amsterdam. So just a ton of bikes. They had individual bike lanes next to the roads, just I guess like how they're trying to do downtown here. But I mean, there's, this is just no comparison. I mean, these were really built for bikes. And, and you can see here, here's a mom. And uh, you know, you've got grocery things in the front, as well as a kid. And uh, you know, I didn't really see very many screaming kids here. And it wasn't very warm either. Um, you know, there are some canals in Copenhagen. It's a beautiful city. Um, obviously, this had iced over. It's a measure of really old buildings. These were, you know, 1500, 16, built in 1500 to 1600s. Then you have the very new buildings there too, with really nice architecture. This is the um, Copenhagen Opera House. Here is the actually Royal Palace, and in fact, there's four of these buildings around in this square. And we went to watch the changing of the guard for the for the Danish royal family, and the uh, flag course up there indicates that the royal family is in house and the prince and his uh, and the, and um, his wife had just had twins so there was a they were much loved um, royal family something called Smerlinbren which actually is the origin of the word smorgasbord which means basically things spread on top of bread so it's very Danish, Swedish thing. So we had a very typical Dutch lunch where it comes with basically meat, things to spread on top of bread. And this doesn't look like very much, but this was incredibly filling for four people. So different kinds of food and, and very interesting. And I really enjoy, actually uh, enjoyed the food a lot more than I thought I would in, in, in Sweden. So from there, we then flew over to Sheffield, England, um, where we met with uh, Professor Chris Chapel, who everyone here has heard of. And... Um, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, English food was actually getting a lot better. But as I'll, I'll tell you what the national food of England is. I, I, I found it when I was there. So Sheffield is not very big. And, and when you just go outside about 15 minutes, it's all sheep farms here. And in fact, we actually had to fly into Manchester, which is a much larger city. So uh, we flew into Manchester and then drove to Sheffield, which is about an hour. Chris Chappell spends like, I don't know, 20 or 30 weeks on the road. And he's got to do this drive every time he has to go to the airport. And it's... It's like oh, it's a good hour of country driving and or, and or traffic. Sheffield, it's a population of just under a million. It's actually where the land of Robin Hood was because there's uh, Loxley is there and there's actually Sherwood Forest. And in fact, there's actually no more trees in Sherwood Forest because they, they had uh, basically um, just felled all those trees to build the, the British Navy back in the 1600s. And uh, it's actually the birthplace of steel industry. It's a real blue-collar town there. Stainless steel was invented there, and many medical instruments were actually made there, including, um, uh, some, I'll go over some, some um, scalpel blades and scalpel handles, which were made there. So they have 10 urologists at the University of Sheffield. They're all on salary, either appointed by the university or the, ho uh, the hospital. And there's no, really, like here, there's only two actually employed by the university. The rest are actually paid by the hospital. Their salary is uh, about 4,000 pounds a month, and they have a huge private practice. I thought we'd be very similar to the British. I didn't think that we were in terms of the way that we practice uh, and, and the way that we're paid. So they will work from about 7.30 till 4 
and then from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock, go and see private patients and private pay patients. They, the private pay patients are also seen in the same hospitals as well. So, and they obviously, in fact, actually the hospital likes these things because it actually makes money off these. They're not uh, an expenditure. You know, we don't have reduced activity days there. They actually, they actually would sit bring in private pay patients to actually help subsidize other things. A uh, good-sized hospital. <clears throat> and uh, Professor Chris Chapel trained with uh, Turner Warwick. I think he was either the second or maybe the last to actually train with him. Um, Chapel's house was actually built in the 1600s, and so he actually has room timbers older than actually Canada. And some of those actually came from the old British Navy ships, so some of those were actually from Sherwood Forest. It was very interesting. As you know, he specializes in reconstructive surgery. When, we, when I asked him about how he deals with urethras, about 40% of his urethras are done primary end-to-end -end anastomoses. 40% he uses Bucky Mucosa now. And, and the really, he gets really, the really tough cases as well. 15 to 20% do two-stage urethroplasties. He's also very involved in research, and he does have a, a lab there as well, and a fairly well-funded lab, tissue engineering, to engineer basically urethra, to try and replace that kind of tissue. So surprises about England. Um, so we all know they drive on the left side, but I thought they would be in uh, um, metric units like us, but everything's in mile per hour. And uh, they even measure weight sometimes in stone. Um, you know, and I guess it all stems back from when inches was like the, whatever, the length of some king's thumb or something. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I guess it's very entrenched in the British. No mass in the OR, even for open surgery. So, you know, we watched a guy doing an open cystectomy with his face right in there, no mask, but he wore goggles. And they said there was no evidence for that. You know, even for protecting yourself, I thought it would be that, but it was very interesting. Um, it, we know that surgeons are called Mr back from the time when they weren't actually physicians, so um, they, he was Mr. Chapel. The nurses cleaned the rooms between the ORs and not the cleaners. In fact, they were actually very fast and turnover was incredibly quick. Um, they even have an anesthetic room for, that, that, that is right beside the OR where they put the patient under and put him under as well and then go into the operating room. I know we used to do that here at BGH, but we don't now. So you look at the OR slate and there's no time on there. There's no like eight to 10 o'clock, you know, radical nephrectomy or whatever. It just basically just says, here's a slate, and you just finish the list. Um, do they go over? Sometimes, but for the most part, they're pretty on time, but there's just basically, you know, you just know you're running behind. They just, you just stay and finish the list. I think the nurses there uh, are generally actually, at least the ones we talked to, were sort of kind of unhappy. They were sort of asking what it's like in Canada, because they've had friends come to the Golden Land and be a lot more happier, be paid a lot more. And in fact, actually, the cleaners and the nurses make almost the same uh, amount there. So they were, uh, um, maybe it's because the nurses are cleaning the rooms, but I don't know. They, 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 they were sort of asking, and they seemed to be a bit unhappy and overworked. The other thing I noticed, too, is there was a lot less nurses there in the operating room than here. There was a lot less redundancy. They just got everything done. If there was something else, there was just two of them to do everything. There was no, uh, no other runner or anything else. They don't mark the patient beforehand. In fact, they argue that uh, really errors only occur when you do mark the wrong side. So they don't mark the patient at all. And they also fought the electric versus razor shaving part. So these were things that they were very adamant on. No masks, you know, use razors because of the, they thought it was uh, stirring up bacteria. And then the other thing was that they leave rings on when they're scrubbing for surgery. So they can leave rings on because they think that, uh, uh, they're describing this to me, that they think that when you take it off, you're going to release a lot more bacteria, whereas scrubbing it on keeps it, uh, basically you're able to sterilize better. I'm not really sure. But on the ward, you can't wear watches, and they have to wear short sleeves, and no, no neckties. Bow ties are okay. So very interesting. Um, and the national food, as I found on Andrew, is actually Indian cuisine. But anyways, I mean, besides fish and chips, but uh, I mean, it's all Indian. So how do you become a urologist in, in, in England? So med school is five years, and again, it's right after high school. You do a one year, it's called a foundation year. It's like a rotating internship. Then you do a one to two years of a senior house officer. You're completely still undifferentiated. So now you've done between two to three years. In your second year, you, you apply to become a registrar, which is now, um, I should, should say trainee, not with a D on the end, when you become a surgical trainee and you pick your specialty. So urology is three years after that. And um, basically, it's your six years to become a urologist. Talking to them, they don't really do much. In fact, you don't really learn how to operate until you become sort of a junior staff. Uh, residents, again, work 56 hours a week, and in fact, it's been decreased now to 48 hours a week, but you can average it over two weeks. 
part of the problem was that uh, the hospital wasn't going to insure that resident if they were over their time. Again, it's in-house call, so they actually asked to have that re re repealed as well, and they, they actually feel it's, it's inadequate. So they said they, they kind of adhere to it, but they kind of don't. It's not the same as in Sweden where they formally said, you know, look, we're just not going to do this. But the length of training they feel is probably going to increase uh, just because of the decreased time with only working 48 hours a week. Uh, they do have shock with lithotripsy there, separate cystoscopy suites, and they have a very interesting targeting time. If someone gets admit, if someone gets referred to for hematuria, you actually have to see them within two weeks and have them cystoscopy and have an ultrasound done. So they have target times, and I think this stemmed from a few years ago when their when their wait times were really bad. So we spent some time in the operating theater. Um, we looked at, of course, this is where Turner, uh, uh, birth, um, a lot of Turner Warwick instruments that he developed for urethroplasty. This is a bougie to help for uh, putting in a suprapubic catheter. This, uh, of course, is the Turner Warwick retractor and curved uh, instruments to help to help keep your line of sight uh, inside the inside the, the perineum and pelvis. So this is the pre-op anesthe anesthesia induction room. So they put them to sleep in here, one full anesthetic machine here. Then you wheel them into the main OR, which is actually over here. So this was the grossest thing I think I found once my trip was that there's just a big stack of shoes inside the change room, and it's all shared shoes. Of course, Chapel had his own shoes, but it was just gross. And nobody wore socks. I, should, I, was, I wanted to take a picture of his feet there, but you just go in there, no socks and all these shared shoes. These were the cleanest pair I could find. Um, and you know, there's blood and gunk on there. I kept my socks on. <laughs> So they have a lot of databasing going on. They had a, a multi-center trial going on throughout England called the PROTECT trial. Um, the oncology guys probably know this better than I. They, they presented their, some of their data for, uh, to this for us. Um, they haven't uh, fully matured the data yet, but uh, basically randomized patients to either active surveillance, external beam therapy, or radical prostatectomy. Their primary outcome was to look at disease-specific survival after 10 years. They have a big tissue biobank of bladder tumors as well as prostate, uh, just like you do here. But this, this data set will mature, I think, in about three to four years. But it cost uh, quite a bit of money, but they have quite a bit. Uh, it was really good to see um, uh, a lot of good collaboration within, within England. So multidisciplinary rounds. This was something new that, that was mandated from the government. Their cancer outcomes were atrocious. I think they had guys at certain hospitals that were doing like three or four radical prostatectomies a year, one cystectomy every two years, and they were still doing them. So they were, you know, not only the 30-day mortality, but the cancer-specific uh, uh, outcomes were really bad. So the government mandated for them to improve things. So one of the th they did two things. One of them was centralized care. You could only do cancer operations in certain centers, and you had to be approved to do that. Uh, the other thing was that they, they mandated multidisciplinary rounds. So radiologists, pathologists, urologists, and medical and radiation oncologists once a week. And uh, the, the nice thing was that you know, people were traveling distances. So they didn't actually follow up with their, their surgeon, but with, with family doctors. But a lot of notes and labs would go to the physicians who would then send notes back to the GPs. So of course you couldn't bill for that in our in our system, but uh, these guys are on salary, remember. So this would be a lot you know easier to do. This is one of their radiologists, and this was the uh, weekly oncology meeting. So actually, I spent this whole day basically with him because he went to uh, a bunch of these multidisciplinary teams or MDT meetings. And there's also a pathologist there as well. So they go over every case, and even um, you know. TAG1 bladder tumor comes in. They just quickly throw it up. Anything else? Okay, no. BCG, yes, no. And then someone is there. Secretaries are there. They're marking it down and uh, basically saying, okay, which ones needs to get done more uh, more quickly? Who should bump whom for getting a cystectomy? Um, there, so it was a lot more sort of a real team approach. This is the uh, endourology MDT meeting where they go over the stones that are coming up for the following week, whether complex or not. And in fact, they have just the regular endourology MDT meeting. And then they have the complex stone cases where they have a lot of paraplegics and other problems, and they, they, they discuss that more in depth. And they do have two dedicated stone guys who I had a, a chance to spend some time with. They do do their uh, PCNLs in the operating room. And uh, operating rooms are actually quite nice, and um, even though they talk about uh, the NHS or the National Health Service running out of money, you know, they still had quite a few nice, uh, uh, nice toys in there. So the other thing they had, uh, besides the, the centralizing the care, the multidisciplinary uh, targets, they actually had target times. So there's a 3162 target they had, patient seen within 31 days of consult request, period. 
and then the patient has to have had the definitive treatment by 62 days, two months, so fairly reasonable. If they were running beyond this target, they would actually bring the patient in on those private practice days and pay the physician slightly more, not quite the private practice fee, which there is a set guideline for, but pay them a little bit more than they would the NHS would pay them. And like I said, gross human tree within two weeks. So we also had a visit to their uh, spinal cord injury hospital, and they have uh, full ORs there. Um, they put in, um, uh, basically, they can do slings, they have video aerodynamics and uh, Botox injections, sphincters, and they can do all that there, basically. Um, National Health Service, just like we have one single pair system, established in 1948, and they, everyone's talking about how it's going broke. So it really sounded kind of like here, but it sounded even worse over there. In fact, they're expected to cut everyone's uh, uh, salaries, actually, nurses, doctors, everyone, by about 10% over the next year, because they're expecting you to do more with, with less. Uh, in fact, the GPs there are paid very well, and often more than specialists. So the urologist salary is somewhere between 70 to 1,000, uh, excuse me, seven, yeah, 70 to 100,000 pounds, depending on your seniority. And their highest tax rate is 40% in, in, in the top bracket. So uh, private practice uh, pay, patients are seen, like I said, and, and NHS will pay for that. So Swan Morton provides about 80%, over 90% of the scalpel blades and scalpel handles within England, and about 60 to 80% within Europe. There is a distributor in Canada, but I think we're more used to, I can't remember the name, who do we have here, is it? Bart yeah, Bart Parker. So we went, to, we went on a tour of their uh, scalpel blade and handle. Um, it actually took an hour, it was interesting to see how scalpels are made. This is the home of stainless steel. For our sightseeing tour there, um, we actually went to York, which is about an hour away, and this is one of their old castles and towers. And it's a, it's a beautiful uh, sort of uh, European city. It was really nice. And here, of course, we had to have some fish and chips. So the UK chief medical officer recommends uh, not to exceed a daily uh, unit of three to four units a day of men, and, uh, of, uh, and this beer would be about two units, and women two to three units daily. So there's a recommended daily dose of beer in England. A unit, uh, a unit is, this is actually quite a big beer, so this was, I think, two units. That's a big unit, right? It's a big unit. <laughs> and football's big here, obviously. By football, it means soccer. So they had the two, two teams in Sheffield. One of them was the Wednesday Hillsboro. And just like the classic blue-collar town that this is, this is what their stadium looks like. And there's uh, Professor Chapel. So from there, we went on to Barcelona, Spain, and we visited Professor Antonio Alcaraz. And this, of course, is in the northern part of Spain. And the official language here is actually not Spanish. It's actually Catalan. And in fact, this is uh, in, in a region called Catalonia. In fact, when you, tell, when you go up to people here and say, you know, are you Spanish? They would say, no, I'm Catalonian, because they hate the Spanish. In fact, they want to separate from the rest of Spain. So Catalan is actually a bit of a Spanish-French mixture. When you hear some of the words, you're like, well, that sounds like French. And they, uh, um, so it, it, everyone's expected to know Spanish, but this is all, all Catalan there. The med school books are somewhere in Spanish, most are in English. The Spanish ones are only Spanish because your university professor has written them and they're expecting you to use it. So most of them are in English. And of course, this is actually the home of uh, Dr. Gil Vernet. So um, Professor Alcaraz is a professor and chair there. He specializes in notes, natural orifice, uh, trans, um, transluminal endoscopic surgery. He also does a lot of MIS and uh, does, was some of the first to describe transvaginal donor nephrectomies. He's got about 110 PubMed publications and is big on transplant. I just wanted to show you. Where is that folder, Jason? Is it on the desktop? You didn't copy that over? Oh, because there was a full, there was a, a video on there too. Okay. Okay. So, um, Barcelona uh, basically has some really interesting buildings, and this is an uh, architect named Antonio Gaudi, who's a very famous architect who it seemed like a genius slash madman. And you know, this is the top of this basically residential building, and he, he designed this interesting way, this attic, to sort of keep in heat for the winter time, and then to basically release heat during the during the summertime to keep costs down. And uh, there's sort of no right angles in this building, and all the chimneys that are used to vent this attic are are are, are shaped in these very interesting shapes. Also, the Sagrada Familia, the um, 
one of the largest churches, which is actually still in evolution. He actually never finished it in his lifetime. And this church is being built solely on donations. So the Catholic you know, church has not actually donated too much money from this. It's built solely on donations from, 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 from basically people. And inside it's just spectacular. It was, it was quite amazing. So uh, Dr. Gil Verne was born in 1892 in Catalonia. And in 1933, he became the head of the department at the University of Barcelona there and has, still has a very uh, strong feel there. And this is where he is buried. So University of Barcelona has a, a very nice clinic there. In fact, um, this was all new. It's only about a year old. Um, so there's, uh, uh, this is Maria Jose Rabal, who is basically Professor Alcaraz's right-hand woman. And she, there is, like, much like we have our Golden Cystoscope Award, the European Urology Association has an award for, uh, just one award a year, for the person who's contributed the most to, uro to urology and advancing it under the age of 40. And she won that uh, two years ago. So she's an incredible person, um, does a lot of uh, notes and as well as laparoscopy. So the med school there, they have about 200 students a year from the University of Barcelona and 300 students from another Barcelona university. So they have about 500 a year. You finish medical school, you get one year to study for an exam. After that, you get to pick your hospital and your specialty after this. And you basically get to pick on how you do on that exam. If you do really well, you get your choice of specialty and hospital. If you don't, you get lower down in the pecking order. And if you don't like it, you just wait another year, write the exam again, and then apply again. 80% of students in Barcelona were, were uh, of med students were female. They had very nice new equipment. This is the Eurodynamic suite. Of course, Jersey does a lot of that, so he's very interested in that. Um, this is uh, digital endoscopic units that they have here, just exactly like we have in our clinic. Uh, trust biopsy was done in the clinic there. So this was all new, and then of course the financial crisis hit Spain. So this was their temporary ER in this portable on the left. This is this big building they were building to basically um, move into for the rest of the hospital, including the ER, urology, and other places. But what happened was they actually ran out of money due to the financial crisis. So this thing has been sitting there for the last eight months, just a shell, and they haven't been able to fill it at all. There's no robot in Barcelona. So, they, you know, it's funny, we go from places that did have money, and this Barcelona didn't really have much money, and they really did a lot by just getting along with laparoscopy and no robot. So residents don't really get to operate very much. Um, in fact, almost always, there's usually two attendings in the room operating together. A resident will hold a camera during radical prostatectomy uh, laparoscopically. And they do do five-port intraperitoneal laparoscopy. And the surprising thing I found was uh, just really minimal, like, like 15 to 30 degrees Trendelenburg. The ORs run until actually 8 o'clock uh, in, in, the, in the main OR, as well as in the private clinics. But uh, it was interesting to see that the residents don't really operate here. I think they learned to operate as a junior resident. So I don't want our residents to complain again about not operating, okay? So how do you become, yeah? Did they, did they tell you where uh, Joe Bernays' son is? No, I, I never actually got that. Do, do you know where he is? microsurgery in the 70s and 80s. I just wondered. Oh, that does seem familiar now. Sorry, I can't remember, Jamie. I do, I do remember them telling me that now, yeah. So five-year urology residency, they have a limit of 40 hours a week. They don't adhere to it at all, and there's no repercussions, there's no insurance issues, there's no problems with that. They get paid about 1,600 euros a month. Rent in Barcelona is expensive, it's about 1,000 a month if you don't share, if you don't live with someone else, basically. Urologists make only 4,000 euros a month, but of course they supplement that with private practice. Okay. Also, they have standalone private practice hospitals. So unlike the English system where you do both in the same hospital, they, they actually have separate hospitals that are just private practice. So Barcelona has 12 full-time faculty, seven oncologists, five non-oncologists. They, uh, they do a lot of transplants. They do have a molecular biology lab. In terms of the research where you know, Sheffield had quite a good infrastructure, these guys actually had a much smaller infrastructure, only about three people actually running their lab. But they, it was still fairly productive. So the strength of laparoscopy, transplant, uh, they do a lot of notes, and they give notes and, and less courses as, as well in Spain. So again, in Barcelona, the same thing. They actually had morning meetings every morning regarding cases for the next day. So you basically had to sort of talk about what cases you're doing the next day and provide the indications and why you're doing them. You talked about any problems overnight, any intake of patients. They have weekly oncology case meetings and, and non-oncology case meetings as well. So uh, they also had, uh, this, this is us visiting the lab here, and you know, even though it was three people, it was, it was, a, it was a small lab, but fairly uh, um, well, well, well appointed. 
So this is um, one of the urologists there who actually runs the animal lab where they give courses and also learn how to do a lot of the notes and less stuff. And let me just show you uh, how little animal activism there is. So this is the door to the animal lab, and this is the street. Like, it's just right across, and there, there's, really, there's basically no security there. They haven't had any problems at all. Uh, a lot of things uh, donated here from um, Olympus and Stryker, so they have full ORs, and this is, real, this is all new stuff. It was very nice. Surprises about Barcelona? Well, first of all, it's pronounced Barcelona, like a lift. And the legend is, is that um, there was a king, a very beloved king in the 1400s that they loved who had a lisp. So everyone was always Barcelona, muthos gracias. There was not Barcelona. So that, it was really funny. It's Catalonians, it was very Barcelona. No siesta. Um, that's apparently a myth. They don't take siesta at all. OR started at 15. They worked till 4. Then again, private practice or so till 8. Dinner, I'm not kidding, starts at 9.30 to 10. And they went early for us one evening at 8.30 for dinner, and the restaurant wasn't even open. We knocked on the door, and they're like, come back in another hour. So they really, uh, they really know how to live. And they go to midnight and get up again and do the same thing. Got to spend a little bit of time. We didn't actually have much time to actually um, um, uh, go to Barcelona itself, but we did go outside Barcelona. So this is just one of their, their fun markets. Uh, we had a nice dinner with Dr. Rabal. And then we drove up the coast one, one day, because it was a weekend, to, to go and visit the Spanish coast in Costa Brava, which was uh, just beautiful. But um, Professor Alcaraz, and this is uh, one of the residents, is uh, just a terrific guy. We had a really nice time. And uh, that's, the, that's the coast there. So then on to Milan, Italy, which uh, we're almost, almost there now. Well, Professor uh, Francesco Montorsi. So he's at the uh, Vita Salute San Rafael University in Milan, Italy. He's got 512 PubMed publications, and there's an H index where you can measure things. So basically, if you're over 30, it means that when you write something, people really take notice of it, and it means something. Um, looking up uh, the highest H index here I think we have is actually Martin Gleave. His H index is actually 52. So Professor Montorsi is the editor-in-chief of European Urology. and also 53. 53. <laughs> And of course, he's very interested in erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy. He pretty much uh, just does radical uh, prostatectomy, robotic assisted now. Um, this was us, one of the residents, and one of his junior faculty. This guy had, they limited him because he submitted more, but they limited him to 20 posters of the EAU from, from this group. So where we went from Barcelona, they had no robot, no money, couldn't finish the building. Uh, this is the campus here at the university in Milan. And right here is where they're going to drop a new five-story uh, surgery building dedicated purely to robotics. It, it, so it went from a real difference. And in Sheffield, you know, or, or in Barcelona where they had three people in the lab, they, they have, I think, uh, like 80, 85 or something in the lab here. We had a full day of, uh, and this is their Urologic Research Institute. It's not the whole building. It's part of the building. Um, we we um, uh, had a full day where they basically went over uh, and talked about their, their research with us and, and, you know, very state-of-the-art stuff, very interesting. So here's all the directors that they are. Dr. Rigatti is, uh, is the uh, professor of the entire department, so um, Montorsi is not the chair. Everywhere else we've been, the, the other guys have been the chief of, of surgery there. So when you look at the wall of benefactors uh, here in Milan, one of the interesting things with the platinum sponsors is, you know, Estellas, uh, blah, 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 and then Dolce & Gabbana, which was sort of interesting because it was part of Milan, which of course is the fashion industry. So Rigatti was uh, very revered. One of his patients really uh, loved him. He did a great surgery for him. So he actually commissioned, this is Bella just fooling around. We were actually there on the day they actually unveiled this. This patient commissioned a statue of Professor Rigatti to be done. <laughs> So maybe one day, Larry, you'll get your own statue in the hallway. And what it was is, this is actually hollowed out right here, and he's carrying a stethoscope. I'm not sure. We were all questioning why your urologist was carrying a stethoscope, but it's all hollowed out. <laughs> and, and on campus, which is very interesting, they actually had a very similar statue, which was also hollow, too, who was Pope John Paul II. So we spent a whole day there with the, the Research Institute looking at all the people that they have. And these are just some of the people there. Um, they, in fact, actually have three people just dedicated to databasing their surgeries and their patients. So their radical prostatectomy database has 1,005 fields, just the, just the prostate uh, alone. And they had, uh, excuse me, four full-time data managers, not three, four full-time data managers. Um, they had um, 6,000 patients in their prostate cancer database. They had a kidney cancer database, bladder and testis as well, and they're starting a sexual medicine one as, as well. So they have erectile dysfunction labs, they do crest injuries, they have animal uh, labs there. Um, you know, so they're, they're really, really well-funded for there. So it was, well, actually, it's actually one of the most well-funded private and public-funded hospitals in Italy. 
And the European urology, I forgot to mention, they're proud of this, that their accepting rate is 9%. Their impact factor is 7.6, which is currently the highest impact factor for uh, urology journals. Journal of Urology, I think, is 4.1. What is it, Dirk? Is it 4.1, 4.2, something like that? And these guys are, are 7.6, and next year it's expected to go to over 9. And I've asked them about this, and apparently it's not because they self-citate which is what everyone thinks. So 90%, 99% of their prostates are done robotically. 80% um, of Professor Montorsi's prostatectomies are private patients, so almost everybody's a private patient. Uh, this, and they have the new SI version as well, and uh, this is not us actually operating, we're just goofing around. He inks his margin and sends them for frozen every time, actually, and um, we'll, we'll wait to, to, and then start the reconstruction, but wait, wait to hear. And if he, I guess he, and actually goes back and takes more if, if it is positive. So how do you become a urologist in, 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 in Italy? This was the weirdest system of all the places we visited. You do five years of med school. You um, write an exam in September. You can only write one exam. So you have to say, okay, I want to do urology in Vancouver. They have their exam on this day. Of course, everybody else who does urology also has their exam on that day, so you can only be in one place at one time. If you apply to maybe something else that maybe has an exam on a separate day, you might be able to attend that as well. Basically, you write your exam. It's 100 multiple choice questions from a bank of 2,000, and they give you the bank. So you've already seen all the questions and the answers. You've got to just remember them. Then you get an oral exam from the professor, and then they decide on four people that they take. If you don't get in and you still want to do it, uh, basically you just spend the next year uh, you're basically working on the ward for free. You don't do any call. You cannot, tip, you cannot actually le uh, legally sign orders. So basically, you know, we saw some guys who were waiting, who I think they were like their third year afterwards, still waiting to get into urology and working on the ward. So basically they were like just scut monkeys doing stuff for like three years for free. Um, family medicine itself was three years. Urology is five years. Salary is about 1,800 euros a month. Rent here is also expensive, about 1,000 a month. So then the fellowship, I met a guy who was in his seventh year of fellowship because he had finished his residency, but he didn't have a permanent job yet. So what he ended up doing after a couple years was opening up a private practice, which most people do, see patients there, but if they need surgery, you don't have hospital privileges. So then you would bring them into the hospital and operate with the professor, and then you would share, uh, uh, I don't know exactly how equally, you would share the fee that that, that would bring in. So really until you get to be, you know, your own uh, professorship or have a permanent job at the hospital, um, you're, you're really uh, working. So it's good to be on top, not so good to be on the bottom. Dr. Montorsi makes 4,000 euros a month. And then, of course, I would assume that most of his income comes from private practice. And you learn to operate as a junior staff. They say that residents would have only performed about five to ten prostatectomies a uh, uh, by the end of their residency. Not a year, five to ten prostatectomies by the end of their residency. So they didn't really do much. You learn to operate when you're a junior resident. Again, they have the 56-hour work week. No one adheres to it. The interesting thing here was that when you see private patients, they obviously pay a fee. Part of that fee will then go to that house staff for seeing that patient. They do have a waiting list. Prostatectomy is about three months, cystectomy is six, six, uh, uh, six weeks. Then we went on to the European Urology Association in Vienna, Austria, which was a really interesting meeting. Um, it, I think it was, it, was about, it was almost as big as the AUA. I think it was almost 20,000 people or so. Um, this was uh, one of the uh, stone meetings in a smaller meeting. They had a lot of live surgery going on. The interesting thing was that Vienna couldn't handle it all. So a lot of these were actually taking place in Germany where they had to fly in the surgeons, get it done there, and then, and then fly over to Vienna. But uh, a nice meeting. I can't remember how many abstracts there were. Um, a lot more, I think, a, a less on original research, a lot more on almost updating what the, the, the status and what the, what the latest and greatest things are, basically. So I think the... Um, I think you know, most urologists think found it very helpful. We were invited to the president's dinner uh, one night, and this was actually used to be someone's private uh, house up until recently, I mean like maybe 30 or 40 years ago. It was just this huge mansion, which they've turned into a museum now, and it's still uh, uh, one of the largest museums that has privately owned artwork uh, in, inside. There we were awarded a plaques that uh, designate our EAU-CAU International Academic Exchange Program with uh, Professor Per Anders Abramson, who was the um, Secretary General. So after that, then we flew back. So basically we were gone from March uh, 1st or 2nd to the 22nd. 
So it was about three weeks' time when we came back. So I'd like to thank uh, AstraZeneca, the CUA, EAU, but also I'd like to really thank the guys here uh, who really covered for me to allow me to actually do this because um, uh, Chris Gohan, Ryan Patterson, Mark Nigro, and Jamie Wright took over all the other um, clinical responsibilities that I had to do. So I'd like to thank them particularly. So thank you very much.